All right, well, welcome, uh, and, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be back at a Linux Security Summit, and I wanted to take the opportunity today to uh, kind of give you guys an update on what's been going on with AMD's Secure Encrypted Virtualization, or SEV, feature. Um, both what we have been uh, doing within the last year and kind of some of the things that we're looking at in the near future as far as open source support goes. So for anyone who's not familiar with this feature, uh, this is a technology that we introduced uh, about a year ago now uh, into <laughs> our server line of x86 chips. And the SEV feature is designed to offer protection for virtual machines from the hypervisor. And uh, so this is kind of a change in the traditional trust model of virtualization. And there's a number of potential scenarios where this is interesting. Uh, kind of the most obvious one is a public cloud type scenario. And uh, where we have this uh, situation where uh, from the guest perspective, so kind of the, the cloud customer, you know, they, they want to, to use a cloud, but they see the potential risk of the hypervisor and the, the access that it has. Uh, obviously, the hypervisor's code that they are not able to control directly, uh, but the customers have various obligations, including sometimes legal obligations to protect the data that they're working with, uh, and so that's concerning. And on the, the hypervisor, uh, say the cloud vendor side, you know, it's a similar situation. They want to be able to offer more security to customers. And really, uh, in general, they tend to see the visibility as more of a liability. Uh, that is the, the visibility they have into customer data uh, as a liability that, that uh, they are concerned if someone comes asking for that, um, you know, that's not really what they want to be providing. And so the, the net result here is that uh, you know, we believe there's this opportunity to uh, try to offer some security enhancements in this space. So the AMD SEV feature is designed uh, primarily to protect against two different classes of attacks. On the one hand, we have uh, physical access attacks, which means someone is kind of physically on the motherboard and they're probing the DDR bus or they're doing a cold boot attack or something like that. Uh, and so because we have uh, memory encryption as part of this feature, then we op can offer strong protection against that. We also are offering protection against uh, certain types of admin access attacks. And so this is like uh, someone with root access trying to do a memory scrape of a guest, uh, trying to inject code into that guest uh, to get it to, to execute that or just as kind of an extra layer of resiliency against a potential hypervisor bug or side channel attack or something like that that can potentially allow one guest to escape its sandbox and, and try to see what else is going on. And so just kind of at a high level, the way that this feature works, there's a few components. Uh, this is rooted in something called the AMD Secure Processor, which is kind of the security subsystem that's embedded in our SOC. Uh, it's got an ARM core on it, it's got some private resources, and uh, this implements the key management, and uh, for the VMs, it provides an API for doing VM lifecycle management. And uh, so this API has things to help with starting these encrypted guests, uh, generating attestation reports, assisting with migration, things like that. Uh, this is publicly documented. We have uh, a spec on our website that details this. And from the kernel perspective, the secure processor just looks like a PCI device, so it has a standard MMIO interface. And this API is intended to be called from the hypervisor as it's doing these various lifecycle tasks. Uh, so the hypervisor is responsible for still managing the resources in the system, calling the various functions that it needs to on the secure processor. And then within the guest, uh, we have support for the SEV feature within the OS kernel. And this is primarily because there's a new x86 page table bit that's defined as part of this architecture. And that bit allows the guest kernel to indicate pages of memory that are to be marked private meaning that they're encrypted with the guest-specific key and shared 
versus shared pages which are accessible to the hypervisor. And so the way this is set up today in Linux, for instance, is that the vast majority of pages are marked as private, except for a few pages that are necessary for uh, either para-virtualization features or things like DMA. Uh, so the nice thing is that once we have that support within the guest kernel, there's no application changes that are necessary, so all the applications within the VM just run as normal and they just default to using encrypted memory. And uh, kind of an example support environment for this today, um, we, we have support, as I'll get to, in KVM, QMU, uh, and then we require using uh, OVMF as the BIOS within the guest VM to help um, to bootstrap that. And, uh, and I say this is, this is now commercially available. Uh, so I've got a, a brief demo video of how this works and, and hopefully this will, this will play. But essentially the setup here is that um, we've got a server, it's running two different virtual machines, one with this feature turned on and one with it turned off. And uh, we've kind of made it pretty with a little website here, but essentially these are uh, just commands that someone with, with root access on the box is able to execute. And so if we play this, yeah, so we have uh, just looking for a QMU process and then pulling up the memory map for it. And then uh, just dumping the memory with a DD command. Uh, and so the first page of memory is, is mostly zeros, so that's, that's of course as expected. Uh, if you do the same, uh, same thing but with a VM that has been run with this encrypted virtualization feature, uh, so we have that on the right side here, uh, we do the same thing and the data is essentially random. And that's because the hardware is aware that we're running in the hypervisor mode versus the guest mode. It only allows access to the key when it's running in the in this particular guest, and so when you try to view that memory from outside, then, then you just see the ciphertext. And so then uh, what this is going to show is uh, just a, a text editor. So this is like a user editing file in that VM. It's just sitting in memory. It's not actually written to disk yet. And uh, the, the admin user on the, on the native box that's running these is going to basically do a grep command on the memory and of course on the left side it's very easy to find the text that's, uh, that's in this file and when they do the same thing on the right side then they find nothing and so you know this is about as exciting as a security demo gets so that's, that's what we got. Uh, and and this, is, this is a two gig uh, of RAM guess. So as you can see, it, it's pretty easy to do. It, it's pretty fast. Uh, okay, so what's been going on in the last year as far as this feature goes? So uh, the main thing is that we've been starting to upstream support for this feature as well as uh, we have the SME, which is Secure Memory Encryption Feature, which is a, a simpler form that's just uh, memory encryption support for a native system. And so we, uh, we got support for that starting in, in 4.14, and then we, we kind of had two sets of patches for the SEV support. So we had the uh, guest patches that made the kernel aware of this new page table bit so that it could be run inside one of these VMs that went into 4.15. And then the KVM patches that interfaced with the secure processor and did all the uh, appropriate management for these VMs went into 4.16. And so depending on when some of the recent commercial distributions picked up their kernels, uh, there are certain ones that are capable of being run out of the box today as uh, either an SCV guest or an SCV hypervisor. Uh, we do have uh, a website that I'll, I'll mention a bit later that has kind of getting started instructions for each of these distributions. So if you're interested in kind of playing with this and want to know the uh, options to give to QMU and all that stuff, we, we do have that um, documented. Uh, the other thing that, that we've just gotten up uh, fairly recently is just some enhancements to the Vert.io GPU support. Uh, 
Uh, we had basic VertIO stuff working initially, but there's some re-architecture of the GPU driver that was needed to uh, work with how DMA works in the SEV world, and so, so that was recently completed. And, uh, and, and so that's kind of where things are right now. Uh, what we're gonna be working on here in the very near future, uh, one thing is migration support for these guests. Uh, this is something that <coughs> is supported in our uh, secure processor API. Uh, we actually do have prototype patches available today on our public GitHub page if anyone's interested in, in trying those out. Uh, so we're gonna be working on getting those upstream. I think right now they need some optimizations, so we're gonna, gonna do that. Uh, we're also looking to open source something we call the ICV tool uh, very shortly, uh, and, and this will also go up on GitHub. And this is really just kind of reference code for parsing attestation reports, uh, validating certificates, things like that. So. Um, all of the formats are documented, but uh, hopefully just some reference code will be helpful for, for anyone trying to use this. Uh, we're also gonna be doing some support for uh, kind of save and restore of, uh, of these virtual machines. And then the other big thing that I'm gonna talk about more here in a sec is uh, support for a feature we call SCV ES, which is our SCV with encrypted state support. And so this is kind of the next major feature in the, the SCV roadmap. So the ES feature, I talked in more detail about this uh, last year at the North American Security Summit, and this is also a feature that's available in hardware today. Uh, it, was, it was shipped as part of the, uh, the initial launch we did last year, uh, and the idea with this feature is to not only protect the memory space of virtual machines, but also to protect the register state across world switches. So uh, there's two main things with this feature. The first thing is that there's now hardware support for kind of this really large atomic world switch operation. So uh, we've expanded what we call the VMCB, which is the structure that holds all the register state for the gas to uh, contain basically everything that's needed, so GPR state, floating point state, and so on, and there's a single atomic switch that happens between the hypervisor mode and the guest mode. And then, uh, and that structure is now encrypted, so the hypervisor cannot actually see what the guest contents are across these world switches. The second piece of this is that for the cases where the hypervisor does need to be involved in emulation for MMIO or, or certain instructions, uh, we have a new exception that we call a VC or a VMM communication exception. And the idea is that when the guest does something that needs support like a CPU ID, the hardware throws this exception and the exception handler then does this pair virtualization thing with the hypervisor to, uh, to process that and, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, this communication is done using a structure called the guest hypervisor communication block or a GHCB, and this is a new thing that, that we're adding. So uh, with the ES architecture, we have divided the types of uh, VM exits into two categories. So we now have uh, this list of we call automatic exits, which are the only things that actually cause you to exit a virtual machine and go back to the hypervisor. And so that's things like asynchronous interrupts, uh, certain instructions like halt and shutdown, uh, certain types of page faults. And then uh, everything else, which is the vast majority, are these non-automatic exits, which are the things that cause exceptions within the guest. So uh, as I said, you got CPU ID, you got your MSRs, you got your IO ports, whatever the hypervisor is choosing to intercept, instead of actually intercepting back to the hypervisor, it now produces this exception in the guest. And uh, so the way that this works is, you know, the guest starts by doing something, say like a CPU ID, and now instead of doing the exit, we'll get this exception. So uh, in response to the exception, there's this new handler inside the, the guest VM that's going to uh, read this error code. It's going to see, oh, I tried to do a CPU ID. I need to write some information to this GHCB structure to tell the hypervisor I want to do a CPU ID. And so it's going to do that, and it's going to do this new instruction we've added called VMG exit, which is basically a hypercall 
in response to that, we're actually going to completely exit the guest. We're going to save the state, encrypt it. We're going to go to the hypervisor. The hypervisor is going to read the GHCB. It's going to see we want to do a CPID. But instead of actually writing the results directly into the registers for the guest, it's going to write it into this GHCB data structure. And it will then resume the guest where we go back to the handler. And so the exception handler will see these new values. It can decide if it likes them or not, if it thinks they're safe. And uh, it can then copy them into its own register state. And it can go back to the guest. So the basic idea is that all of the uh, kind of intercept behavior things, they all get uh, funneled through this centralized exception handler. So the rest of the code, uh, whether it's in the kernel or in user space, doesn't have to be aware of the security feature. So one of the, uh, one of the pieces of feedback we got very early on with this was that it would be really nice if there is a standard protocol for doing this para-virtualization stuff between guests and hypervisors, regardless of vendor. And uh, so we decided to take on the challenge of trying to standardize this. And, and I, I mentioned this last year as well. And, and I honestly hoped that we would be a little bit farther along than, than we are today. Um, it's not anything to do with this feature. It more has to do with the fact that many of our security and kernel developers were kind of busy earlier this year. You guys might know why. So, uh, but the good news is that, is that we are coming back to this. So uh, just last week, I believe, we posted publicly a copy of what we call the GHCB software specification. Uh, it's not that long. It's less than 20 pages, I think. And this is uh, kind of a first draft of our attempt to standardize this. And so this is open for feedback. Uh, there should be a mailing list thread on this pretty soon. And, uh, and we've been shopping this around both within the open source community as well as with the proprietary vendors. And the, uh, the specification here, it defines a few things. So of course, it defines what the, the memory of this structure looks like. Uh, it defines which specific exceptions guests are expected to handle. Uh, and that's because there's a lot of potential uh, intercept bits in our architecture, but uh, most of them don't need to be set. And so uh, we're defining exactly what the minimum subset is that's required for support. And uh, with each of those, we're defining what values the guest is expected to provide for the emulation and what the hypervisor expected to provide back. Uh, and then there's also a few things in here about how we do bootstrapping uh, and how we, we bring up multi-vCPU environments, uh, NMI handlings, and other kind of weird oddity. And so what we're really hoping to do here is to provide uh, this unified interface so that uh, your guest OS can boot and doesn't have to be aware of exactly what hypervisor it's running under, things like that. So if you look at the document, what you'll see uh, in part are a number of uh, entries like this that basically say, OK, on this particular type of exception, how does the protocol work? So for instance, if the guest does a read MSR instruction, it will generate this exception. And then the guest is expected to set a few fields in the GHCB structure to say, you know, I, I want to do a read MSR. And here's the RCX value, so indicating which MSR I want to read. And in return, the hypervisor supplies RAX and RDX. Uh, similar for CPU ID, there's different things. Really, one way to think of this is it's basically a sparsely populated uh, register state structure. So just instead of everything being supplied, uh, only the values that are actually needed are being supplied to the hypervisor. So uh, as I mentioned, feedback on this is welcome. Uh, we have started receiving some feedback already uh, that I did want to share. You know, there's been a, a few things that uh, I think have gone pretty well. I've actually been pretty impressed with how well uh, kind of people have worked together as far as both the proprietary and the open source community. So, so I think that's really great. Uh, in the current specification, we have the layout of the GHCB matching that of the legacy VMCB. So basically, the state structures look the same. 
Uh, and so that's really helpful from a compatibility standpoint because uh, they can use the same memory offsets, everything. Uh, it also turns out that there's quite a lot of similarity across hypervisors in terms of which behaviors need to be intercepted and how those intercepts need to work. And that kind of makes sense because it sort of falls out of the x86 ISA uh, quite a bit. And in uh, this type of a virtual machine environment, the hypervisor really has to be very hands-off. It has to let the guest run as much as it can until it does something that it really has to step in for. And so uh, because of that, we, see, we don't see much variation here. And, uh, and also the way that we negotiate this protocol, so we do have this version so it can evolve over time. And there's a way that as the guest boots, it can find out what version the hypervisor supports and respond accordingly. Uh, there were a few interesting challenges that we did discover during this, uh, this initial review, and I say we're just getting started on this. One is, uh, so there's this VMM call instruction, which is traditionally used for hypercalls. And of course, it, it kind of makes sense that different hypervisors would use VMM call for different things. What we also discovered is that their calling conventions are completely different, and there's no way to make them mutually compatible. Uh, so we basically had to throw our hands up on this one, and we basically said that, you know, look, you're going to have to customize this particular behavior depending on your hypervisor. Uh, we also had some, some challenges around uh, things like AP startup. So this is how we boot the other vCPUs if you have multiple cores within your guest. Uh, traditionally, this is done using an a interprocess interrupt or an IPI. Uh, which tells the processors where to go and start executing. But uh, we don't want the hypervisor to be able to supply an arbitrary instruction pointer for them to do that. So we kind of had to rework this protocol a bit where the hypervisor can wake up a core, and then the core has to go and uh, get its actual uh, jump address from its encrypted memory. Uh, so this is kind of a new protocol. You know, we have it prototyped. I think it works. Um, this would be, be something to review. And then uh, we have a few other things that are really not supported in the current spec. Uh, so hardware debugging is, is not really supported. Uh, many of you are probably aware that a couple years ago there was a, a CVE about how uh, hypervisors have to intercept debug traps because otherwise the guest can spin forever. There's kind of a processor deadlock situation that can happen and they can do a denial of service. And so because of that, we're not really able to make use of these in one of these isolated guest environments. Uh, we also don't have support for SMM today, and I hope that stays that way, but we'll see. So the, the final thing I just wanted to mention is kind of an update is uh, we have started looking at ways to leverage SEV support with containers. And so we've started to get involved a little bit with uh, the Kata Container Project. And this is a project that uh, works on running containers using hardware virtualization. Uh, and, it's, and it uses kind of a stripped down uh, version of the Linux kernel, I think based on clear Linux. And uh, we have been looking at ways to enable the SEV functionality within that project. And uh, it turns out that's actually not too difficult because the kernel support that we're already upstreaming kind of flows into that uh, with some modifications to the runtime. And uh, you know, the way this works is very similar to a normal container. It's just that there's a new option for specifying an SEV runtime. And uh, when you do that, then uh, you get a container that's, that's using this feature, and if you were to look at the memory from outside of the container, it would be the same as that video that I showed earlier, that it would all look to be encrypted because it's in a VM. Uh, so this is not upstream yet, um, but we do have, uh, we do have the, those patches on our public GitHub page, so if that's something you're interested in playing with, I would encourage you to check that out. Uh, so you know, overall, we're we're making progress around SEV. Uh, we're, we have a few areas that we're working on, and the encrypted state feature is kind of the big one that, that I'm hoping we're going to make quite a bit of progress on within the next year. And, and part of that is trying to standardize this interface uh, between guests and hypervisors. And so I hope that works out. <laughs>
We do have a new uh, developer.amd.com page, so that's got links to all the specifications related to the SEV feature, uh, as well as um, we have a, a public GitHub page that has kind of getting started instructions for if you want to start running some of these um, encrypted VMs. Uh, you know, right now, a lot of it's still script-based. We don't have any nice GUIs yet, but I'm sure you guys can figure it out. And, uh, and as I mentioned, there's a tree on there as well with some of the Kata stuff if, if you want to play with that. So that's what's been going on. Uh, any questions? Um, I haven't worked with AMD yet, but I worked with Trust Zone, ARAM Trust Zone. So you mentioned before uh, all register state. So the question, I'm trying to understand the difference. Uh, could you please define the all register state? And second question is, why do we need to encrypt those when we do a, when do we do a switch? Because usually one shouldn't have access to a different register state, as I understand. And the third question is, if they encrypted where uh, this encrypted state is stored or kept, Yes, Thanks. so I'll Thanks. see if I can remember all three of those. Uh, so the, the register state, so it, first off, it's specified in our public x86 docs. So if you want the full list, you can look through that. But essentially, it's uh, all, the, all the VM state that used to exist, so kind of the basic control register or segment state. Uh, it's all the general purpose registers. It's all the floating point registers. Uh, and it's uh, a certain set of MSRs related to like system call behavior and, and things like that. The register state is encrypted so that the hypervisor or somebody with root privilege is not able to see it and gain information from that. Uh, for instance, if you are, uh, there can often be privileged information in registers, like if you're using the x86 AES instructions, uh, the key for your AES operation is actually in one of the XMM registers in the floating point unit. And so, you know, that's something that we would ideally not to just have there sitting in memory if you take a, an, say an interrupt while you're in the middle of an AES operation. Uh, the, the data itself, it, it's stored in, in normal memory. Um, it, there's no special location for it. It's just that uh, it is encrypted with the guest specific key. So it looks basically like any other page of guest memory if the hypervisor tried to read it. So it, it just sees the cipher text. Thanks. Sure. Thanks for your talk. First, is the actual contents of uh, guest memory access accessible through JTAG? So uh, on our parts, when, when parts are configured for production, the JTAG interface in general is blocked off. So uh, there is no JTAG um, debug support at all on our production AMD part. So, so no. Okay, and th second, does it something? Does it this feature some has something to protect against side channel attacks or mm, make it more difficult? Yeah, we we don't have any specific side channel protection. Um, you know, the the one thing that we're able to offer is just because the the memory space is encrypted with kind of a per guest key. You know, if you have say a side channel that lets you kind of read memory with hypervisor permissions. You can't use that to see the plain text of another guest, right, because the hypervisor normally can't see the plain text of another guest. Uh, but there is nothing specific for, um, like, side channel attacks within a guest or anything like that. And what about CPU caches? So uh, in terms of the security or the side channels? Or, so, so the way that this works with the caches is that uh, each cache line is tagged with the address space ID that the cache line belongs to. So uh, the data in the cache is stored in the clear, but it's tagged with the owner of that data. So only that VM can access it. If the hypervisor tries to read that same address, we'll treat that as a cache miss because the tags don't match. Uh, so there is no way to uh, kind of leak data directly through the cache. Uh, but as far as kind of general cache side channels, as I said, we don't have any specific features there. <laughs>
Thank you. Try to minimize the run. Um, so, other than the um, GMCB register state, uh, most of this seems to be about um, confidentiality rather than an integrity of the system. Is there anything that pre prevents the hypervisor from, say, replaying the same, like snapshotting a page, running the guest for a while, and then replaying the old encrypted page? Yeah, so in general, in this generation, the answer is no. Uh, that the memory is, it's just. Uh, encrypted, it's not integrity checked. Uh, we do some integrity checking on the state page specifically um, because we see that as being kind of an easier target for that. So there is some protection there, but in general, um, yeah, rollback attacks are not, not blocked today. Okay, so is it fair to say that in the present generation this isn't a protection against an actively malicious? Hyper That's correct, okay. yeah. So there was a question somewhere over here. Well, I had two questions in the previous, was the first question, so I won't duplicate it. Um, is there any relationship to any TPM keys and the keys inside the VM? I know that you guys have a TPM in SCP. Um, so is there any relationship at all between the keys and the association between a key that might belong to that application to? Yeah, there, there isn't today. You know, the, the functionality that the secure processor provides certainly has some similarities to a TPM in terms of the way that uh, when you set up one of these things, you basically do a measurement of the initial BIOS image, and that gets uh, turned into basically the attestation report for the guest. Uh, but it's not a TPM-specific interface, and today we don't have a way for the guest VM itself to actually call any services on the secure processor, it's only there for the, the hypervisor to use. Uh, so if the guest wants uh, a TPM-like functionality, it basically would have to provide it itself in software. But your SCP, I thought, implemented a TPM as well, So in, inside the same space. Yeah, so in our client generation of parts, we do support what we call firmware TPM, so we right. basically emulate a TPM 2.0. Uh, we don't support that in our server line of parts. Uh, which is the, the line that supports this feature. Um, that, that's mainly because we do it as kind of a cost-saving measure, and for server, the cost-saving isn't as important, and you know, the firmware TPM is not certified like a discrete TPM is. Unfortunately, I think I have to stop for discussion, but the good thing is now the coffee and tea break is there, so I think we can maybe continue the discussion there. So let's thank David for the talk. Thank you.